Hey there and welcome back. The last few weeks we've been looking at the wonders and the cities that made them famous. But today's wonder is going to ask us the age-old question, is it better to be famous or infamous? The Temple of Artemis was said to be a thing of beauty. It was destroyed several times through its history, from a man that just wanted to be remembered, to an invasion, and finally clashing religious ideals. And much like Rhodes, they were conquered over and over. Because if you take anything away from these videos, it's the ancient Greeks did not have life easy. Ephesus was first inhabited sometime around the end of the Bronze Age, by a Greek Ionan tribe sometime around 1200 BCE. The Greek Ionans were one of four tribes that came from Western Anatolia around 1000 BCE. At the start of the 7th century BCE, the city was conquered by the Sumerians. This brought the city under the rule of the Lydian kings, but along with this came new prosperity for the city. The city started to thrive, became one of the richest cities in the Mediterranean. The city was also famed for being a center of learning and fair treatment to all. One of the most famous ancient Greek philosophers was born in the city around 500 BCE, named Heraclitus. He spent his life trying to figure out how the world was formed. The city of Ephesus also treated women in a way that modern women have been trying to take and be treated for years. They enjoyed all the same rights and privileges that their male counterparts enjoyed. And I wouldn't expect anything less from a city that was said to be founded by Amazons and held a goddess in such high regards. They were allowed to become painters, sculptors, artists, anything that they wanted to be. The city of Ephesus had a very rocky relationship with their neighbor, the Kingdom of Lydia. They resisted being conquered by them for years, all the time adopting new traditions and cultures from Lydia. But sometime around 560 or 550 BCE, they were finally conquered by Lydia. They succumbed to the King Croesus. The Lydian King Croesus was known for his wealth, which he is said to have gotten from the river Ptolus, the same river where King Midas went and got rid of his Midas touch, making the river's sands rich with gold. <laughs> Croesus used this wealth to help create the Temple of Artemis. Artemis was known as the protector of young women, girls, hunting, and wildlife. She was born from Zeus and Leto. And why did Ephesus choose to make her their patron god? Well, it was said that she was born nearby where Ephesus was founded. Even though there's still some ruins from the Temple of Artemis, the archaeological record can only show us so much. And this is where we have to rely on written record. And the problem is the written record isn't always accurate. There might be some discrepancies because the people that wrote them didn't necessarily live alongside the temple itself. And where do we get our written record? From three main guys, the first one of which was Finley the Elder. He was a Roman that lived during the first century CE. The second being a Greek geographer named Strabo that lived sometime between 64 BCE and 24 CE. And finally, a Roman architect named Vitruvius that lived during the first century BCE. The temple started construction sometime around 550 BCE. We don't know exactly when, but it was massive, larger than the Parthenon in Athens. And according to our before-mentioned old people, the master architect was Kephron of Gnosis and possibly his son Medigenes. But whoever was the master architect wouldn't live long enough to take and see it constructed, because it took around 120 years to finish. And when I say it was massive, I mean it was massive. It measured about 129 and a half meters long and 68.6 .6 meters wide. There were 127 columns, each at a height of 18.3 meters and a diameter of 1.2 meters. The columns were arranged in a double row around all four sides of the temple, and the columns that stood on the exterior of the building all depicted reliefs of ancient Greek mythology. And the ancient Greeks had enough forethought to build the temple on marshy ground to help prevent any damage from earthquakes. It's said that they used charcoal and sheepskin as the foundation for the temple. The temple was located outside of the city because Artemis was said to be the protector of boundaries, being that either physical or otherworldly. The exterior of the temple was decorated with friezes, depicting the Amazons founding Ephesus. Ephesus was said to have been founded by them after they fled from Heracles when he was on his ninth labor. Heracles was tasked with getting the girdle of Ares, and he had to take and go to the Amazons. When he got there, the Queen Hippolyta met him, and after feeling threatened by them, he slaughtered the Queen and took the girdle and ran away. Inside the temple, there was a statue of Artemis made of cedar wood, but it didn't depict Artemis in her normal form, standing with a bow and arrow. Instead, it depicted her as the Anatolian earth goddess Cybele. Cybele was a pre-Greek god, and they incorporated a lot of Cybele's traits into that of Artemis for the Greek mythology. Now we arrive at the question I asked at the beginning. Is it better to be famous or infamous? Well, on the 21st of July in 356 BCE, a man put this to the test. His name was Herostratus, and he set fire to the temple's roof because he wanted his name to be remembered for all of eternity. But the people of Ephesus declared that his name should not be recorded. So how did his name get recorded? Well, we don't really know. All we know is that the Greek geographer Strabo 
recorded it from somebody else's work that is now lost to us. And where was Artemis when the temple was being burned down? Well, according to Plutarch, she was off helping deliver none other than Alexander the Great. Alexander conquered Ephesus in 334 BCE, and the temple was already being reconstructed. He offered to help with any of the finances to rebuild the temple, but they declined any offer of help. According to Strabo, the temple was reconstructed and it was even grander than the first one. But this is where the written record differs with the archaeological record. What we found was the temple actually was smaller than the first temple, although they did build it on a higher platform to take and make it more domineering. The second temple stood until 267 CE when the Goths invaded. They plundered the temple for what it had and then they destroyed it. And because the people of Ephesus couldn't be kept down, they rebuilt the temple again. And this one only stood to 401 CE, when Roman Emperor Theodosius I declared that all pagan practices be banned and a Christian mob destroyed the temple. But this time, unfortunately, there was no rebuilding it. They let it sit in ruins, slowly being reclaimed by the earth. It's not to say it was forgotten. During the medieval, new stories started to spring up that some of the columns were actually used in Constantinople and the Hagia Sophia. Although this isn't true, many of the blocks actually did make their way back into the city and were used for new constructions inside the city that made it so famous. The British Museum has many of the artifacts, none of which I can show you because they want me to pay for licensing. And you know, it's kind of ironic that they're asking me to pay for licensing of stuff that they stole. So if you ever make your way to Turkey and you find yourself there, you can see what the British decided to leave behind. I want to thank you all for watching and I want to thank the patrons. With their support, I'm able to make these videos happen. And we can all take a lesson from the people of Ephesus. When bad things happen, you just need to rebuild and keep going.